Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elizabeth George, Director of Member Engagement and Chapter Development with the American Guild of Organists. And I am so pleased to welcome you to one of the most highly anticipated webinars of this year that is really going to talk about live streaming music legally in churches and in recitals. And before I introduce our illustrious panel, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes that I want to go over with you. First and foremost, this is being recorded as we do with all AGO webinars. So there's no need for you to be scrambling, taking notes. Uh, it will be downloaded and then uploaded probably by Friday onto the AGO website. You can find it under the education tab. I want to thank those of you who have submitted so many questions over the last 10 days, which have been forwarded to our panelists. And I know they're going to address as much of what you have sent as possible. However, we have factored in some time uh, towards the end of this webinar. Uh, should you have any other questions, you can please submit them through the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. I'd prefer if you did not use the chat box. So if you move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Click on it, enter your inf type your information in, hit enter, and I will be monitoring this throughout the webinar. So let me tell you a little bit about our wonderful panelists. Eileen Hunt, who's going to be serving as our moderator today, most recently served on the National Council of the AGO as Vice President and Counselor for Competitions and New Music. She has performed for national and regional AGO conventions and has a particular interest in performing new music. Dr. Hunt holds degrees in organ and musicology from Boston University. She has served in parishes in Massachusetts and Connecticut as an organist and music director and has performed organ recitals all over the US and throughout Europe. Rena C. Cronin serves as general manager of One License. Combining her passions for worship, music, administration, and hospitality, Rena leads One License and engages thousands of churches, schools, retreat centers, religious communities, funeral homes, and campus ministries as their resource for online music licensing and uh, permissions for congregational song. She lives in Chicago and is a proud alumna of Northwestern University. David Scopp is president and founder of Sela Publishing. His undergraduate studies were at Calvin College in Grand Rapids. David has led workshops, hymn festival, and reading sessions for national meetings of the Hymn Society, the American Guild of Organists, the Association of Anglican Musicians, the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians, the Presbyterian Association of Musicians, and the National Association of Pastoral Musicians, as well as leading many other regional events. He is currently uh, serving as organist and choir master and is presenting today from his beautiful Trinity Episcopal Church, or excuse me, Cathedral in Pittsburgh. So before we get started, David, I'm going to turn this over to you because I think you'd like to share a little bit about how this content is being presented and the capacity in which it's being presented. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. I miss seeing you at the Atlanta AGO that was canceled. Uh, that's one of the highlights of my summer, seeing you all at conferences. As uh, Elizabeth said, I'm speaking to you from Trinity Cathedral, where I'm part-time organist choir master which, uh, like many of you, means more time behind the computer editing audio and video than actually making music. Um, this is a nicer venue than my house with the dog barking and uh, Sela's offices where projects are piled up all over the place. So I thought this would work. And I also was actually here earlier trying to get better audio sound for our live stream that happens on Sunday morning. So it's a constant uh, work doing that. Um, so I, I, we started stream, live streaming in April. So I've been through the exact same thing so many of you have been doing as well. 
we did want to have a disclaimer. Neither, neither Brenna or I are lawyers. And uh, so what we're providing is not, con should not be considered as legal advice. And a lawyer would say the same thing because everyone's individual situation can be very different from place to place. So um, we, we hope we'll give you useful information that you can use and point you to the resources that will be helpful in your work in finding out the way to do that. I'm really heartened to see so many people here because in my 30 years, I know that church musicians want to do the right thing. And hopefully this will help you in being able to do the right thing with your live streaming. So an overview of what we're going to be discussing today. We're going to talk first about copyright basics, uh, including a short history lesson and discussion of the relevant types of copyright for church musicians. Um, then we're going to go over synchronization for church music, uh, church worship services which is what so many of us are struggling with. Then a short segment on synchronization for performers or artists, uh, including recitals, that sort of thing. And then at the end, we'll be talking over a number of practical matters and, uh, at, and also having uh, hopefully some answers to the questions that have been posed throughout this. Um, so to start with, let's uh, go over copyright basics. And I'll pass this over to Brenna to start that. Great, thank you, David. And thank you, Elizabeth and Eileen for such a warm welcome. It is so exciting to see the numbers still climbing of the attendees today. Uh, so this is just wonderful. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to say that you're here, so you're already doing the first right thing, right? Getting some knowledge, getting some information. And like David said, if we don't have the answer for you, we're gonna put you in the right direction. Um, just a little bit of understanding around what the word copyright means. So it's a form of intellectual property law. It protects the original works of authorship, and this can include any type of artistic medium. So literary, dramatic, musical, uh, poetry, novels, songs, even computer software. Uh, copyright must be in a fixed form or in a fixed medium. So you can't copyright an idea. So when you use a service like One License, for example, your congregational reprints that you're posting online or the services that you're streaming or all those, those types of things that we'll talk about today, you're working with a licensing agency that has done the work of securing those permissions for you. So when you have a license with an organization like ours or any other organization, you're already again taking that first right step, which is really important. So instead of seeking out the majority of the time, those copyrights all individually yourself, you're coming to quite literally one place to be able to get your license. So I know that um, there's a bit of a learning curve with all of this, especially with the pandemic. I think it's thrown a lot of us for quite a loop. Uh, we're doing things that we never thought that we would do, or we have new parts of our job description that are all of a sudden uh, being thrust upon us. Um, so just know that we're with you. Um, we understand the learning curve element of all of this. And again, I fundamentally believe that all of you are here because you're doing the right thing and you're coming here for the, for the right answers. Um, I'll note too that if we aren't able to get to your question on the call today and if it's specifically one license related, you can always email our team at info at onelicense.net, I-N-F-O at onelicense.net, um, and we can certainly uh, answer your questions more specifically. So again, a reminder, in order to use music, because that's what we're talking about today, you need permission to do so. And you need permission more often from the copyright holder. And that's hopefully what we'll be able to illuminate for you a little bit more today. David? Thank you. Uh, intellectual property is probably uh, more amorphous than any physical item, but it is still a protected asset under US law. I hope you don't go into your local grocery store and steal a candy bar because no one is looking. And in the same way, you shouldn't feel free to steal someone's copyrighted work for use in your live streaming of church services. So now your history lesson. I'm gonna talk about uh, four copyright laws. There've been a lot of statutes passed over the year, but the first one is the Copyright Act of 1790. And the reason I bring that up is to show that copyright has been an important part of US law since the founding of our nation. It is uh, at that point, it didn't specifically include music, but it was generally understood to include books that had music perhaps in them. 
And the term back then was 14 years copyright and could be renewed another 14 years. Uh, fast forward to 1976, there are a lot of statutes in between, but in 1976, the Copyright Act made copyright a federal grant. Before that point, federal law only applied to items that were registered with the U.S. Copyright Office, and all other copyrights under uh, common law were administered by state. And of course, as you can imagine, having 50 states in the possessions in the District of Columbia uh, managing copyright law made for a convoluted system of government. So in 1976, it all became a federal program of copyright administration. It also extended the copyright terms, um, and I won't confuse you with dates or anything, uh, because it, it's only the most current that you have to worry about as far as uh, the, the current law. In 1998 was the Copyright Extension Act of 1998, which is often called the Sonny Bono Act or the Mickey Mouse uh, Protection Act. Um, and the reason it, it's called Sonny Bono, he was a legislator from California, uh, half of the Sonny and Cher duo, introduced the legislation. And it was called the Mickey Mouse Protection Act because at that point it gave Disney an additional 20 years protection to uh, their copyright of Mickey Mouse from its earliest images. So what it did was made the uh, life of the author plus 70 years or 95 years from date of publication, whichever is less. Then in 2018, there was the Music Modernization Act. And that was brought about because of the explosion of the internet and digital methods of sharing content. Um, it also lengthened recording copyrights to 100 years and, and more going on. But um, it did address a lot of the issues that arise with digital streaming. So copyright exists when something is created. It doesn't have to be registered to be a valid copyright. Only if you want to sue someone do you have to register the copyright with the, the government uh, for infringement. You used to have to even put on a copyright notice on something, but that is, uh, isn't required anymore, though it's a smart thing to do. So what is public domain? Public domain is anything after 1924 for print music, um, because that's 95 years after that. There are things that might be in public domain, but it's easiest if you just generally assume that you're waiting until the end of things being out of, of copyright. The, so in 19, that's in 2020, anything after 1924. In 2021, anything after 1925, and it starts on January 1st. So on January 1st of this year, George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue became a public domain work. In January 1st of 2021, Sweet Georgia Brown will become a public domain work. Now, when something is public domain, it doesn't mean that there can't be copyrights attached. And that's because there can be arrangements of, co of public domain works. For example, we have an arrangement our company published of Amazing Grace by David Ashley White, which uh, thousands of churches have done. It has substantial contribution to the public domain melody of uh, New Britain that we all know. And it has different accompaniment and that sort of thing. So that, even though it's a public domain tune, there can be copyrighted things using public domain elements. Secondly, the one thing that's important to understand as well are what are called derivative rights. If we hold a copyright for a tune and you do an arrangement of it, you don't hold that copyright. The original copyright holder always has automatic copyright in whatever you do. Now, they can assign it to someone else. They could assign the copyright to you. But it is a matter of, of ownership and not diluting the ownership by multiple copyrights that then uh, could be used and, and profited from without the original copyright owner's permission. 
So today, there's lots of elements of copyright law, but today we're going to talk about four items of copyright law that are important to church musicians. We're going to talk about print, which we all pretty much know. You've all had bulletins where you put the uh, music in the middle of it. For example, this is from March 15th, our last live service. Um, we all pretty much know what that's about because we've been uh, doing that for 30 years with CCLI and one license, a lot of us. Um, you need a license to print copyrighted things and so you've, you've arranged that. Then there's such a thing as mechanical rights. Audio recording, CDs. People know about CDs or albums. One for, old one from Trinity Cathedral I found. Those are sound recordings only. And so for permission for that, that's co considered mechanical rights. Then there's public performance. If you perform a co copyrighted work publicly, you need a public performance license. Colleges and universities and concert venues will often have an ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC license, which allows those works to be performed legally. And Brenna will talk a little later about some other options. Most publishers rely on these uh, performing rights organizations to handle permissions, uh, though most publishers will do this as well directly with you. Now, you're asking, but I don't do that for church, and you don't, because there is a religious exception. Copyrighted works may be performed at worship services without payment or purchase of a performing rights license. Now, that's only for in-person worship services. That does not uh, extend to you broadcasting that on the radio, uh, streaming it to Facebook or to your website or putting it on YouTube. So the religious exception really only in, uh, goes for what is done in person. So that brings us to the last item, synchronization. And synchronization, and, and the word comes because you're synchronizing sound to a video or image. So it's not just sound alone, like a CD or a record. It is a item that is being broadcast, typically. It's what you would call uh, anything that's on television or on movies. Those are synchronizations licenses that have granted music to be allowed to use in there. And so... Uh, that's, of course, the bulk of what we're talking about because it's a new world for so many of us uh, being forced into this with our uh, physical spaces closed and unavailable to our parishioners and for people to come. Uh, Brenna, at this point, did I leave anything else you want to add? Yeah, just that going back to that religious exemption idea, purchasing the music, whether that's an octavo that you're playing, whether that's a whole booklet of instrument or anything, you're more than welcome to, to use that, like David said, in the four walls of your building. You've essentially, if you paid $2 for that octavo, you can play it as many times as you want, and the author or the composer has received a royalty based on that $2 octavo that you purchased. But the second that you want to take that performance, please, uh, uh, be mindful of, of, we know that church is not performance, but there's a, a level of, of using the word that's a good understanding for us here. Um, so when you're performing the work, you're allowed to do that within the four walls of your building, but you're not allowed to take it outside of the four walls of your building. So we would consider posting on the internet to be outside of your four walls. The same thing goes for that question that we see all the time, which is I've purchased the hymnal, so why can't I put the words up on the screen or why can't I put the words in a worship aid, well, you're taking it out of its original form. So when you purchase those hymnals, you purchase them for the express purpose of using the hymnal as is, opening up and then closing it. So are you more than welcome to have the numbers up on a board? Absolutely. Are you more than welcome to have the numbers in a bulletin or in a uh, wedding worship aid or a funeral worship aid or something like that? Absolutely. But the second that you want to take the text or the music out of its original form, that's when you need a license to do so. And one license, just as an example, there are other licensing agencies and publishers, of course, like David said, can license directly as well. But we're here to make that really easy for you. Eileen, do you have any questions or comments, uh, sort of having served as an organist and uh, 
all the questions you've received. Anything that you want to add to this or concerns? Well, I'm just so grateful to both David and Brenna for being willing to share their expertise with us. Um, as I've talked with many colleagues over the last few months, uh, everybody's struggling with the same issues. People want to be in compliance with the law. People need to be broadcasting services uh, during this pandemic, but they're just not sure of what's legal and what's not. So I've had so many conversations with colleagues and we're all in the same boat. We have to learn what we can do and how we can do it. So uh, David, I'm so grateful that you included some of the history and um, information of the background of just about the basic copyright law, uh, where it came from. And um, I'm just so grateful that you're able to share your expertise with us this afternoon. And I know how important this is going to be to everyone attending or listening later. Thank you. Thank you. All right, why don't we move to uh, synchronization for churches. And what we're talking about with synchronization for churches is non-commercial. You aren't charging for people to come to church. You're talking about worship services. Um, so Brenna, why don't you talk about the use of hymns, choral, uh, vocal, instrumental repertoire in uh, synchronization for churches and what that might cover? Yeah, of course. So I think one of the questions that we get most commonly when you're looking at, um, I know recitals was mentioned in the, in the title here, uh, you want to make sure that it's a non-commercial event. So if that's a Christmas concert uh, for your young people, your youth choir that's giving that, um, if it's uh, anything that is deemed to be within um, a worship type of setting, then you're going to want to consider a non-commercial license, which is something that we offer. If you, for example, um, are hosting a commercialized event at your physical building, um, I don't mean to over-specify, but just because it happens within a church doesn't always mean that it's always non-commercial. So if there is an artist or a special guest uh, that is coming to perform works and they're charging a ticket fee or anything like that, um, even donations can sometimes be a little tricky. So always reach out and ask about that. But if it's a commercial entity in any type of, any type of situation, you're going to need a mechanical license from the publisher directly. So one license isn't able to license for those types of events, and that's really important. So when you're trying to figure out first and foremost, we want to put on this event, we want to do it legally, how do we go about obtaining the licensing for the event? Start with that first question of whether it's commercial or non-commercial, and then go from there. One of the things that I want to highlight um, specifically about the different types of licenses that we offer a lot of it has, um, has, has grown. I would say that our licensing options in theory haven't changed, but the way that people are using them has changed significantly. So most folks know our service as uh, an option to get copyright uh, reprints of congregational music. So what you would see in a worship aid, uh, what you would have in a, in a reprint box on the back of an octavo, uh, the text that you would see on a projection screen. Um, so typically pre-pandemic, there is my, my pre-pandemic awareness and then now my during pandemic awareness, of course, right? Um, I wouldn't say that much has changed as far as how we're approaching things, but I think everyone else's awareness of what they're doing has changed. Um, you are required to have a license to reprint music or to reprint text. So we use the word music kind of generally, and it's important to acknowledge that even if you're just posting the text to holy, 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 for example, and even though the text might be approved by ISIL for you to use, in order for uh, you to have permission to post that though, there's probably a, a mass setting or a Lutheran liturgical setting or some type of setting that you're using with it, right? So you wanna be really, really careful that you're giving acknowledgement of the actual setting that you're using. It's not just the text that you're putting up on a screen or the text that you're putting into a worship aid. So most folks know our service as a way to reprint congregational reprints. Now, before the pandemic, we had about 1,700 license holders, 1,700, that were posting their services online, and now we have about 12,000. 
it was a significant increase. We are thrilled that so many of you have been able to reach your churches, uh, to reach your congregations during this, uh, I won't say the word unprecedented because it's overused, but this unprecedented time, right? Um, and I think it's really important for us to think about that idea of taking it out of it, out of its original entity, out of its original source, right? So you can have the performance rights for you to play that octavo, for you to play that organ prelude, for you to play that choral anthem in the four walls of your building, but now you're posting your services online and you need a podcast streaming license to be able to do that. Now you're posting your choral anthem online, you need a podcast streaming license in order to be able to do that. Of course, of course, of course, if you're only posting the service, um, like the sermon, or um, anything that's not music oriented, then you don't need a music license for that, of course. Um, there are some organizations that are maybe just, or they were previously just posting their sermons online. Um, but if you're including music in any type of capacity, you need a license to be able to do that. There are two main licensing companies uh, for, for the church world. Uh, one license, that's who I'm with. We tend to lean more liturgical, uh, so serving Catholic and mainline Protestant organizations. And then CCLI, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. My church actually has a CCLI license for our youth group, uh, so it's not uncommon to have licenses of both, especially if you can afford it. Um, CCLI uh, tends to lean more evangelical or praise and worship or Pentecostal in their style, so things that you might hear on contemporary Christian radio. So kind of going back to the the steps of formulating, you know, who do I need a license from? How do I need to figure this all out? Start with whether it's commercial or non-commercial, and then move to who actually covers the music that you are looking to use. Just because you have a license with one license doesn't mean that you can use everything that you want to. And the same thing with any other type of licensing service. We work with about 300 different member publishers and we have 80,000 songs in our catalog. So there's a strong possibility that if you're working with folks uh, who are our member publishers, uh, GIA, OCP, Oregon uh, Catholic Press, some of you may know them as, Augsburg, Oxford, Hope, Sela, the list is long, there's 300 of them. Uh, you're more than welcome to check uh, out that list on our website. Again, commercial or non-commercial, and then who actually has the copyright of the music that we're looking to use. Those would be the first two places that I would start. One other thing that I'll mention here before I hand it back over to David. Um, some of you have had questions, and I see a couple of these in the Q&A. Um, some of you have had questions about whether podcasting, which that's a general word that we use to refer to anything that's pre-recorded, and streaming, if those are the same thing, of course they're not tangibly the same thing, but we treat them the same way. So whether you're, uh, I'm in the Chicago area, I know the Archdiocese of Chicago was recording their services on Wednesday and Thursday, and then posting them on Saturday and Sunday, whether you're pre-recording or podcasting, the way that we, we look at that, or if you're literally giving the service live and showing it live, we consider both of those to be the same exact thing. They're both covered under the umbrella license of our podcast streaming license, and you can use both of those uh, styles or some combination of the two. We see lots of churches that are pre-recording music and then kind of editing that into their service and then posting that up, that's fine too. So I, I use a volleyball analogy, if you'll humor me for just a moment as a sporty person. I want you to think about us serving you the volleyball. We're giving you the permission. We're giving you the, the website to find everything that you need. And however you bump it or spike it or drop it, or kick it or interact with it in any way, the vast majority of those types of interactions are going to be approved. They're going to be okay as long as you have our license. We really and truly trust that you are the best people to know what your congregation needs. You're the boots on the ground. You know if you're a projection screen church, you know if you're not, right? I know some of you are laughing right now because you think your pastor would never ever allow projection screens in your sanctuary. Regardless of the style, the style of worship of your church, we're here to support you with that. One question that I can answer really quickly from Margo in the chat. Um, Facebook does have some policies uh, that are being updated October 1st. Um, I'm going to um, just screen share really quickly so I can show everybody where they can get information about that on our website. 
Um, so if you visit our blog, news.onelicense.net, so again, news, N-E-W-S, dot one license dot net. We just posted um, this uh, post here a couple of days ago, understanding Facebook's terms of service. You are more than welcome to check this out and see how the changes in the terms of service are going to affect you. Um, a big highlight for you is that most of the um, terms that they're expecting of you are actually terms that one license has always expected of you. Uh, so I don't think you're going to uh, experience a huge shift uh, in time or energy or anything like that, um, but just some really good things uh, for you to be able to go over there. So I hope that that's helpful. Again, news, N-E-W-S, dot one license dot net. And in just a second, I'm going to put uh, that link into the chat as well. So Margo, I hope that that answers your question. As a reminder for everyone, you are welcome to post your services anywhere online. Some ideas include Facebook, Zoom, YouTube, Vimeo, your church website, and you're allowed to keep your license up for the duration. You're allowed to keep your video, excuse me, up for the duration of your license. Um, so there was anonymous attendee that had a question um, about keeping your worship service up on Facebook. You can only do that as long as you have a license to be able to do so. The second that you, your license expires or you cancel it or anything like that, those services have to come down. All right. So if we're talking about in your live streaming or Facebook live or your YouTube uh, performance, if you only ever use public domain music. You don't have to get a license. But the question should be, I think, for you, is that how you want to present and limit yourself for it? Because there are really affordable options to be able to do that. And secondly, are you certain that what you're using is only public domain? Because as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of arrangements of public domain things that are under copyright and then would require the licenses to be able to perform those directly. Another thing that's often confusing to people is that you cannot take someone else's recordings and use them in your live stream or pre-recorded services without permission. And that's not something that one license can provide. In fact, there's uh, no agency out there that can do it. It has to be the original uh, there, you have to request permission from the original copyright of that sound recording, and you have to get permission from the underlying copyright, the, the music that, and uh, perhaps text that is being performed. So you can't take something from uh, Washington National Cathedral that you really liked and insert it into your service because you are uh, violating a copyright that you do not have permission to do unless you have specifically and directly gotten that from all the copyrights that are on there. So it, uh, we, Brenna did talk over live streaming. We're, we're talking about synchronization, but it's, it's live streaming, whether it's pre-recorded or actually live done or a combination of both. I've seen all those you're done and no matter where you're putting it on the internet whether it is Facebook or Vimeo or uh, the YouTube channel that you have for your um, congregation so dealing with these uh, if you're not using all public domain which I think very few of us could ever get through without doing that what can you do well first you could if you wanted contact directly every single copyright holder for every piece that you want to perform on a weekly basis. You used to have to do this before the onset of CCLI or one license where you wanted to put something in the bulletin and you didn't have a license, you contacted the copyright holder, you got permission, you paid the fee, and then you were legal to do that. The advantage, of course, of CCLI and one license when they came along is that you had one stop for most all of your use, you didn't have to worry about that. So you can go directly to the publishers for any of your live streaming. And in fact, every week uh, we handle licenses for churches and uh, institutions for live streaming or bulletin worship aids, those sorts of things. So that those are always available for you to do. But the reason, there's a good reason for having the use of services such as onelicense.net uh, because the, 
I know most of us love doing administrative work. I mean, that has to be the favorite part of our jobs, right? It makes life easier when you have a one-stop shop. So the CCLI and One License, they handle both print licenses and podcasts or streaming of worship services. And One License includes the publishers you always see exhibiting at the AGO Nationals, uh, Augsburg Fortress, Fred Bach Music, GIA, Henshaw, Hope Publishing, Morning Star, Oxford University Press, Paraclete, Wayne Leopold, Sela, hundreds more, as, as Brenna said. Um, and as mentioned, Brent, the one license tends towards the more liturgical churches, and CCLI tends towards the more evangelical or Pentecostal repertoire, such as word music, uh, hill song, those sorts of things. So another option, which is only for streaming, it wouldn't cover you under any of the uh, bulletins or worship page you might include things in, uh, is Christian Copyright Solutions which is uh, it, what it does is that it takes the licenses through anyone that is a, uh, artists, publishers, composers uh, of ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Um, so that is a streaming option for you, but the, the drawback to it is it's about 10 times more expensive than one license. Um, so it, that is an option, and that is one that can also be used for non-worship services and uh, commercial uh, events. So that's something else to, uh, to look at when you're looking for options from that. But um, here at uh, Trinity Cathedral, we've uh, subscribed to the one license uh, podcast streaming. We've had, used it for print licensing for years and years. But now we, because of this, we had never been doing any video. But we are, we did add on the podcast streaming options. So what I'm going to do is uh, hand it over to Brenna a little bit to talk about the one license offerings and what to do, especially if you can't find something. How, how can you go about that? So Brenna? Yeah, absolutely. The, the finding thing can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Uh, there was a question that Elizabeth had forwarded to me earlier and the person had mentioned this dark alleys type of feeling. Um, and I, I hear you. I, and I sympathize with that. Absolutely. Um, we cover 80,000 songs in our catalog. Uh, but that doesn't always mean that the data from our member publishers is there. So it's important to note, and again, I'm going to get my screen sharing started here. Um, it's important to note that if you are looking at our homepage and you are looking at the list of member publishers that we work with, as a general rule, if a member publisher is listed here, then the copyrights that are intended for congregational use are going to be covered under the reprint license. And then any other works like uh, anthems or instrumental pieces, preludes, postludes, et cetera, if the podcast streaming button or icon here is listed, um, then you're permitted to use those in your services as well. So uh, to, to look at an example, um, let's look at GIA. So GIA is one of the uh, co-owners of the company and the parent company of One License. So just to give you an example, all of the congregational uh, reprint elements from either GIA or from their sub catalogs. So you'll see Tizé listed here, the Iona community, et cetera. Uh, those are all approved for our reprint license because if a member publisher is a part of our service, that's the, the bare minimum license that they have to sign up for with us is the reprint license. Additionally, on top of that, the podcast streaming license and the practice track are covered by 99% of our member publishers. There are only very, very few that don't participate in that kind of license. So when you're, first of all, trying to check and see whether a song is covered or not, this is where you want to start. Is the member publisher a part of our service? If they are, then you can go ahead and search for the title um, through uh, your account. You have to have a license to be able to actually download anything or to report anything. But what I'll note, though, is that there is an option to submit manual submissions in the case that you can't find something. Now, this piece um, of this is a little bit of that dark alley that I mentioned a minute ago. I will offer this, um, and I hope that it's helpful, and I hope that it's empathetic for, for the pandemic situation that we're finding ourselves in. When we only had 1,700 churches that were posting their services online, and now we have 12,000, 
you can imagine that there's so much more repertoire that our churches are using now that they weren't using previously. So not only is it the amount of churches that are looking for podcast streaming permissions, but it's also the amount of repertoire that they're looking to use. When our service was created, our member publishers were really only thinking from the congregational reprint perspective. So having a manual submission process is really helpful. So the manual submission process, and we have lots of super helpful um, tutorial resources on this as well. So you can search the word manual, again, from news.onelicense.net. That's our blog site, and you can find information there. Um, but really, that's a way to organically generate the catalog, and then the publishers themselves are the ones that go through and review those entries. So they're the ones that decide if the title should be covered, it should not be covered, etc. Um, I will say that our publishers have uh, different uh, lengths of time in which they review those. Some of them are in there once a week, some of them are only reviewing them twice a year. Um, so I understand that it can be a little tricky and it can be a little bit of a catch 22 of okay Brenna's telling me that I have to do this because I can't find this title but then the publisher is not approving the title I understand that it can be a little bit tricky so as you submit your manual submission if you haven't heard back uh, send us an email and we're happy to follow up with that member publisher and hopefully they'll have a good answer that we can pass along to you for those of you who are brand new to our service, feel free to check out this options and prices page here. I won't overly go into it, um, but as a general rule, we offer uh, a few different types of licenses. There are reprint licenses, and those can come in the form of 24 hours, one week, or annually. And then there are podcast streaming licenses that can come, again, in, in the same amount of, of times, um, but you can either bundle them with reprint permissions or you can have podcast streaming permissions on their own. Podcast streaming permissions on their own do not permit you to share the words or the notation. I, I hesitate to say the word music, right? Because it's too... Uh, inclusive of a word in a lot of ways. You can't use the text or the musical notation in any type of capacity if you only have the limited podcast streaming license. This is so important. If you are handing out a worship aid, if you are putting text on the screen, um, either as an image or text floating on the bottom of the screen, like a sing-along type of uh, you know, movie or something like that, that's all permitted as long as you have the bundle license. So very, very important. Um, we also have options for schools, um, and then we have options for practice track licenses as well. Um, since we get lots of questions about recordings, I'll mention this really briefly. The practice track license that we offer is intended for rehearsal purposes. So this might be something where a music director looks to uh, make a commercial copy, so like literally burning a CD, uh, downloading an mp3 from the internet and sending it uh, via email, via Dropbox. Again, there's kind of that volleyball analogy of we're going to give you permission, but how you actually go about doing it is up to you. Um, that is permitted for rehearsal purposes, but that does not mean, going back to what David said earlier, that you're allowed to share mechanical, well, you need a mechanical license for a commercial track. So you can't include a commercial track. When I say commercial, I mean like created in a uh, sound studio, downloadable on Amazon, found on a CD, right? Our service allows you to make non-commercial recordings. You yourself playing at the piano, your instrumentalist joining in with you, your choir, all of those are permitted. Again, non-commercial through our license. But if you were to try and include a, a commercial recording, an MP3, something like that in your service, uh, two things are going to happen. Number one, I doubt that a publisher is going to give you uh, permission to do that in the first place. I think uh, with respect to all of you as musicians, we want to be really careful that there aren't, um, that folks aren't using uh, recordings as a way to not give musicians jobs. There's a justice element that's in this, right? So you can't just furlough your organist and play a CD for your mass. Um, I hope that some of you all would, would agree with the justice element of that, right? But then the second piece, of course, is that Facebook or YouTube or any other site is going to immediately strike your video. If it includes any type of commercial recording, it's going to be 
it's going to be a full stop um, on that. They have all kinds of um, bots that are constantly scanning their videos uh, and including any type of commercial recording is just not going to be something that's that's going to be okay. Um, so if you have further questions about this, shoot us an email. I'm happy to, to talk further about it. Um, but I think that that kind of highlights a little bit about if you don't have a license with us, here's where you can go to get the information, this options and prices page, um, but also pretty clear about what's covered and what isn't when it comes to a commercial perspective. All right. We had an interesting question. Do you need to, do we need to list our podcast live stream license number in our YouTube description? 110%, yes. Okay. And if so, does it need to include all the titles and composers of the music we perform again? 110%, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. So what I would expect to see, um, and not only is this from an integrity perspective and from a justice perspective, it's also from a making sure that bots ignore your video perspective. I would expect to see specifically listed all of the titles that you're using including public domain titles, because just because you're using it in the public domain doesn't mean that there isn't uh, an appropriate credit in a way that's given to the person who wrote it, right? And then after the list of all of those titles, I would expect to see your licensing information. Uh, I, in the most pastoral way I could possibly say it, uh, if you are posting videos online without any type of copyright or licensing attribution, I promise that you will get a very nicely worded letter with my letterhead on it. <laughs> We're here to help you. We're here to educate. We're not here to police you. Uh, but I can assure you that that social media site is going to catch you uh, a lot faster. And they're going to put some claims on your account. And Brenna as well, and you, you touched on this a little bit. Is it commercial if you take a collection, but you're not charging? That sort of, that's, is that, that's a gray area, isn't it? Yeah, well, I would put that back on you and I would say, is church a commercial entity if they're taking collections? I, no, I no, right? Uh, if there's a donation element that's here, uh, I, I mentioned earlier there was a little bit of a gray area. Um, I, I will say that if it is a ticketed performance that you are expecting payment for, whether the performance is in person or online, because we're all dealing with all kinds of different COVID restrictions, uh, if the intention is to collect money, then it's likely a commercial endeavor. Um, but if it's your regular Christmas concert and you're taking a special Christmas collection, no, I don't think anybody would consider that commercial. David, do you have a differing opinion on that? Well, that's a worship service. It's it's traditionally assumed people have collections to uh, for the running of the institution. Sure. And it's it's not a collection for the music, even though it's usually music that's being performed during an offertory of sorts. Um, but that's that's typically what what's assumed by the religious exemption. Um, one thing I wanted to go back to uh, when you request permission for anything but the mechanical rights. Mechanical rights are the only one where the amount is set in the statute of how much you have to pay. Uh, you have to pay a maximum of 9.1 cents for something under one, uh, under five minutes for a CD if you're producing it for every single copy. Now, if you're asking about print rights or performance rights or synchronization rights, there's nothing in the law that says this is the maximum amount you have to send to do it. Now, for publishers, of course, there is a fine line of being able to stay afloat and pricing yourself out of the market. If we decided to charge $1,000 for every church that wanted to live stream an anthem of ours, uh, we would probably have nothing being performed. So it, that's the advantage of using one license or other agencies because it's a flat fee. You aren't surprised by something coming out there. And there are publishers who really seemingly don't want you to use their things because they make it so difficult to get a license or they make it so extraordinarily expensive that it's not worth the resources to do that. So that's an unfortunate part, but it's a way that uh, publishers work to try and find where they can uh, both sustain their businesses, but also uh, support their, and support their composers and authors, but also make their works as widely available for everyone as possible. 
So um, a segue then, uh, and we've had a little bit about this, perhaps Ben, we could talk about synchronization for performers and artists, if they wanted to include works on their website or individually, um, can they do that through one license? Yeah, you just cut out a little bit, David. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? If for, for an individual that ha is a performer, uh, they want to include something on their Facebook page or they, on their YouTube channel. Can they do that through one license? Yeah, great question. So I think uh, individuals can absolutely be licensed. So we, we look at this often with uh, traveling musicians or retreat directors that their ministry is, is reliant on the fact that they're bouncing to other physical locations. Um, so 100%, we can absolutely license for that. We have um, special mathematical ways that we figure out what their category should be. Um, but if it's an artist that's covered under um, a publisher specifically, and they're using their own music on their Facebook site, um, I would argue that that is a little bit um, self-promotional. And there's certainly some licensing language that they can include to be a good steward um, of that. And they can talk with their publisher about that. Um, but they wouldn't earn a royalty on the use of their own music. Absolutely. And uh, if you're concerned about certain works, contact the publisher. Um, as Brenna said, sometimes those type of things work well for publicity for both the publisher and the artist. So many are willing to uh, have reduced fees or, or make it very affordable to do that sort of thing. Um, so maybe uh, it's time we move to what is probably the most anticipated section of being the practical aspects of doing mm. this. And one thing I want to point out um, is that it's very important that you record your usage. Uh, that is the way that those revenues that you are paying to the licensing agencies get back to the publishers, get back to the composers and authors. And especially in this time when there's not much live music being made, there's not much need for choral music or new things because there's not as many services in that. Uh, it is a form of supporting your favorite publishers and, and artists by using their work, but most importantly, reporting it. it it's only as effective as the reporting. Yes. And that's uh, something that uh, we, you have to stress. And report, and as Brenna said as well, it, as a uh, equity issue, recognizing the efforts of people that, whose works you're using in your services. Mm -hmm. Put that in the comments uh, in Facebook, the credits for all the things that you're using. And probably it should also credit the musicians that are doing it because they're the ones contributing to that. And that's just a matter of, of, of being doing the right thing. Um, for that. Yeah, so, and I'll add to that, David, it's twofold. So there's that outward facing and then the inward facing uh, justice element here. So the outward facing is anything that you put in the description section of your video. So folks know where they can go and find that piece of music if they want to use it themselves. And then of course, there's that bot element that we talked about as well that's scanning through all of the videos. But then on the internal side, I'll, I'll be very transparent with all of you. We pay out to two decimal points. And David, as a member publisher in our service, can, can share what it is like to have the actual livelihood of these composers and artists being paid out to two decimal points. So when you have a license with us, wonderful, fantastic, you have access to the website, but that does not mean, my friends, that you have accurately given representation for what music you're actually using. Your money has essentially gone into a pot and we don't know how to distribute it. So it is so, 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 so important as I'm sure all of you at conventions and conferences have met these individuals. Some of you may even be authors and composers on your own right as well joining us today. I cannot stress this justice element enough. If you are behind on your reporting, I have information I can send you. We have a post on our blog that you can read through to figure out how you can catch up on your reporting. But I promise you, I promise you that it is worth the effort 
for you to log in and to report your usage. We know that some folks have gaps in uh, their laps of their reporting. We know that there's turnover. We know that we're in a very stressful season right now and maybe um, the job has kind of laxed a little bit in a way. You can catch up. You can catch up and I promise you that we will pay out every single royalty, millions of dollars, my friends, that we pay out to these individual people. I cannot stress it enough. We've got a question here and um, David, I'll ask you, and this is from a chapter leader, uh, one of the AGO chapters, and many chapters are doing members recitals, wherein each person is playing a different classical work. It might be Bach, uh, Callahan for another performer, uh, and uh, they've always asked people that come in, we ask for a donation. We are hoping some people may come to our program virtually. Does our chapter have to buy a license or does each individual purchase or does the church the performer belongs to, can they use that license? Well, I'll, Lots I'll defer, there. <laughs> I'll defer to Brenna about whether the license of the hosting institution would be viable. Would that be an option, Brenna? It depends on the attendance number that you're expecting to reach. So for example, again, we talked about the commercial versus non-commercial element of this, right? And I'm seeing lots of questions in the chat. If there's a donate here button, I would consider that to be similar to a collection. Instead of passing a basket, you're asking people to donate online. And again, that's kind of a reasonable accommodation from a COVID perspective. So that's just fine. Mary asked that question. Um, but when it comes to whether your actual event is covered, for example, our, our categories, our licenses are divided by category based on attendance. Some of you are likely very aware of this. So if you're in category D, as in dog, you have clearance for up to 200 to 400 people on an average weekly attendance. So if that works for you, 52 weeks out of the year, that's wonderful. Maybe the number goes up around Christmas and Easter, totally understandable. It goes down during the summer, totally understandable. As long as the range is in there, you're gonna be fine. But if you have a one-off event where you're trying to reach a thousand people, that's very different. That's something that you're gonna need a different license for. And that's absolutely something that we can help you with. And from my experience, most of the publishers of uh, instrumental music, organ music, are very willing to work with AGO chapters and grant free permission often, uh, depending on the type of event, to allow those things to be used uh, with uh, and for the AGO chapters. So it's a some simple matter of contacting the publishers uh, directly and see if there is a need for an event license beyond that by what is being used. Yeah. At this point, um, one of the practical things, uh, there's a, a video that one license has uh, prepared, and, I, and we're going to present that. I think this would be a good point to do that, Brenna. So if you want to share that uh, with the people, that gives you a background of uh, what you can do in practical, very practical matter. Absolutely. And if anyone wants to review this again with your teams after the fact, I've put it into the chat bar. Uh, it's again, news.onelicense.net. And if you search the word copyright in the upper right hand corner, this post, this black and white picture here will pop up for you. I'm going to play this video for you now. It is, my friends, four simple steps that you can do today to ensure copyright compliance. Really and truly today, you can do all of these today. And I hope that you find them helpful. Just to confirm, can you all still, my, still see my screen? Yes. 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 Great. Hello, license holders. This is Brenna Cronin, General Manager of One License. Whether you are brand new in your position or just wanting to start the year on the right note, here are four simple steps that you can do today to ensure that your organization is copyright compliant for the coming year and beyond. Number one. Ensure that correct copyright and licensing information is listed on all materials that you reprint. This includes the title, composer, copyright year, and any other information included in the reprint box of the given song, as well as your one license reprint information. Be sure old company names are removed. Only one license should be listed and not any reference to onelicense.net, Word of Life International, or licensing online. Be sure the phrase, reprinted with permission under one license number, 
and insert your number, period, all rights reserved, period, is printed on your worship aids, bulletins, projection screens, YouTube videos, Facebook lives, and anywhere else that reprinted or streamed music is used. Number two, view your present and download a copy of your previous 12-month reporting history. From the Report Usage tab, account owners, sub-users, and group managers can review the current quarterly reporting period, meaning what titles have been submitted for 12 weeks in the past and six weeks into the future, as well as their legacy reports and 12-month histories. To review past reports or download a copy of your 12-month reporting history, scroll to the bottom of the page and click the appropriate link. This is a great way to audit your usage and hold your team accountable for anything missing. Number three, destroy photocopies of music that you find. Go through file cabinets, old bookshelves, and even pay a visit to that dusty old storage room. Non-congregational music that was photocopied without the express consent of the publisher is illegal and can carry debilitating fines. Even if you didn't photocopy the music yourself, if your church or organization is in possession of or distributes illegal copies, you could be faced with a claim of copyright infringement. Before destroying the music, take note of the titles, composers, and publishers of the pieces so you can contact them for legal octavos or versions. Protect your organization. Prioritize this task. Number four. Confirm that your category size correctly matches your average weekly attendance. Every organization that has a license with us is set into an average weekly attendance category. This category indicates the range of people you have attending your services. These ranges ensure that whether you have a dip in summer attendance and a spike around the holidays, or if you have traveling college students or snowbirds, your organization will be covered regardless of the season. You can view your current category from the Licenses tab under My Account. Visit the Options and Prices page to see the range of categories and make sure that your organization is in the right one. Typically, you can communicate increases or decreases when your invoice is up for renewal. If your category change is significant, please contact our office and we can assist in prorating your account. So in summary, Copyright compliance in four simple steps that you can achieve today. Number one, display correct copyright and licensing information. Two, view and download your reporting history for auditing. Three, destroy photocopied music. And four, confirm your category size. Thanks for taking a few minutes to review this information. I hope you feel empowered to follow up with your team on these four important steps to ensure that your organization is copyright compliant this year and beyond. As always, please reach out to our team at info at onelicense.net if you have any questions. Have a great year, everyone. All right, I'll hand it back over. And uh, one question people often ask, well, how long does it take to report? I spend maybe five, 10 minutes a week uh, doing it. And when I forget, then maybe I'll spend 20 minutes catching up at the end of the month when I've not had it checked off my to-do list. So it's, it's not an onerous task to do it. And again, as Brenna said, every single one that you record, that money goes directly to the publisher and the composer and author. So it is money in their pockets and they appreciate it very much. Um, at this point, there's a lot of other things that we might be able to cover, but I think by the time it would be best if we try to address some of the questions and answers. Uh, Elizabeth, and try and give answers, I should say. Okay, uh, this I think would be directed to Brenna. So do we need to also list the prelude and postlude music copyright info along with the info for the hymns? Yes. Okay. I had one question. I can't find it here, but I, I can tell you what it said is so our church has licenses for all music that our, cho our, our choir performs, but we often share music with another church. <laughs> What, what happens, do, do they need to pay licensing as well? 
So again, we're catching ourselves on the word music. So when you say that you're sharing music, what exactly does that mean? Uh, are you sharing photocopies of, of physical uh, octavos or instrumental books? Oh my goodness, I sure hope not. Uh, are you sharing uh, MP3 recordings uh, of music? Uh, I sure hope not. Uh, I think the answer is I sure hope not to a lot of, of these. <laughs> um, but I, I will highlight something that we're seeing uh, happening a lot. And I will mention that there's a little bit of a gray area uh, when it comes to this, just because it's something that did not exist. Well, it existed, but it didn't exist with such prevalence uh, until the pandemic. And it's the idea of making uh, these virtual choir videos. You can make them as long as you have the license for it. And again, our service can offer that if we cover the song, of course. We can't just blanketly magically cover everything. Um, but sharing someone else's virtual choir video is a really, really tricky piece of territory. So we've seen this for a long time. If you're scrolling through Facebook and you see something that you like as a person, as an individual, and you want to share that with, with, you know, your Facebook community or something else, that's entirely fine. I mean, that's the purpose of social media. And nine times out of 10, there is probably a, uh, a right that's already on the video in the first place where there's some monetization that's happening, uh, like if it's on YouTube or something. So generally no one even, you know, bats an eye when there's a performance at the Emmy Awards and then people share it the next day, right? But with these virtual choir videos, it gets a little tricky because not only are you sharing a video that someone else made, so it's not your property, you need permission from that entity to be able to share it. And then also on top of that, you need permission from the copyright holder of the piece. So the publisher may very well be totally comfortable with you licensing that through us and reporting that through us. They might be totally fine with that, but just because the church down the road makes a virtual choir video doesn't mean that you're able to share it. It's gone beyond the extent of its original license permissions and especially not as an individual, but you as an entity, you don't want to get in the business of sharing other people's videos without permission. One more that I think is interesting, and you both maybe want, want to comment on this. We are intending to offer quote unquote musical meditations outside of a worship service. We have CCLI licenses and think with our added pastoral prayer, prayer scrap excuse me, slash scripture added and put on our church's website, that is okay. Am I right? Or must we have it as an in-person event? Oh, I, so I can't speak on behalf of CCLI, but if you were to ask that question to me, I would answer it from, it sounds like a worship service to me. So whether it's a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, that, that doesn't make a difference to us. Eileen, any questions, comments that you want to add to this or that, that you feel need to be addressed or from a perspective of an organist? Well, there's an interesting question um, from the standpoint of justice, which we've talked about several times today. Um, would either of you care to comment on the responsibility and obligation of somebody who is using, performing, playing an unpublished work? of a composer. What is the right thing for the person to do who's using an unpublished work? Perhaps it's by a friend or colleague of theirs. Um, from a justice standpoint and, and uh, wanting to do the right thing, what is the person's obligation towards a piece of music that is not published? I, I can start with that answer. The, uh, one of the things the US copyright law uh, allows for is that you cannot record something for the very first time without permission of the copyright holder or in this case a composer. You would have to have expressed permission. That is something that is reserved. Once it's been uh, in a recording, then it is open game for anyone to record that using the statutory mechanical license. And so, uh, but the very first recording of it is one that is reserved to the copyright holder. And if it's, a, if it's an unpublished manuscript, that would be the composer themselves. So you would have to get express permission from that composer, even if it's unpublished, to be able to do that. 
Yes, that's very helpful. I, I know there's a lot of people out there who enjoy uh, performing and, and presenting music of their colleagues, which may not at this point be published. Thank you for that. Someone has asked, so if I want to use a video slash music selection from YouTube, is that considered commercial recording? You can't do that. <laughs> you cannot do that. That's a no-no. Yeah, not in, not in your service or in person even. Projecting a YouTube video in your church without permission from the copyright holder of that video is very illegal. It'd be the same as, as uh, during worship service, use, pr uh, presenting a Disney movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, you <laughs> cannot do that uh, because that is other people's intellectual property. And that is a very different license of, uh, in something I didn't even get into, a different part of copyright law of using uh, video grams pre-recorded items in uh, public settings. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's why you'll see the notice when you do purchase a DVD, it'll tell you that this is intended for home use or for personal use only. So once you take it out of your home, it's a big theme for us today. Once you take it out of its original setting, then you need a license to be able to do so. So showing a, a video that you don't have permission to is not going to be covered. I know that there are some that may have a kind of a secondary question to this is, can I use lyric videos? Because in theory, a lyric video may be intended for that purpose. Well, you regardless, you still can't use it unless you have permission from the creator of the video and the copyright holder of the content. So if you see uh, OCP, for example, has created lots of lyric videos. If OCP has created it and they're the copyright holder, well then fantastic, you only have one place that you have to go. But if you're looking to use a video that has a separate creator from the copyright holder, you need to ask both. And I, pr I promise you, you do not want to be responsible for the creator's lack of securing licensing permission. That's not a, a gamble that you want to take. So who knows, you reaching out to that copyright holder and asking permission, they might not even be aware that there is a video that someone else has created with their copyrighted material on it. So asking permission from both in that experience is vitally important. Well, I think we're going to wind this up because uh, while we have had a lot of questions posted, I think you really have covered, there have been a lot of the same and you've covered them. And uh, we will be posting this recording. We're also going to, to do the, the links that you shared, Brenna. Uh, David, we want to also, even though it's on our COVID-19 resource page, certainly put that wonderful article that you did for TAO in the July issue up there. Uh, and we do have a great COVID-19 resource page that goes through all of the licenses and re uh, resources for uh, musicians and religious institutions. So I encourage you to, uh, for everyone to take a look at that. Eileen, any last closing thoughts? <laughs> I think the, the information that has been shared with us this afternoon is very, very important and very much appreciated by our membership. Uh, I think this has been a very important session for people who just need some guidance uh, about doing the right thing and understanding the whole licensing and copyright issues more fully. Um, thank you so much to both of you for your expertise and for sharing your time today. And Elizabeth, thank you to you uh, in your position as um, membership uh, at, at National Headquarters for spearheading this and, and for making this all possible. We are very, very grateful to all of you for this. Thank you. Well, we had a good conversation about this, Eileen. You really started this, so I have to thank you. Uh, and I hope that our members feel free to contact me about other content that you'd like to see us present. So I'm going to say thank you, Eileen. Thank you, Brenna. Thank you, David. Thank you all for participating. And uh, you'll be able to view this, as I said, probably by Friday. It will be up on our website. Everybody Can I say one stay thing? safe. Oh, yes, Elizabeth? yes. Um, 
if you wanted to get in touch with me, I'm on Facebook. Sela Publishing is on Facebook. Excellent. Our website is selapub.com. Another resource you can go to, copyright.gov. That has the current statutes for copyright. It's great bedtime reading. I recommend it to everyone. Um, but if you wanted to eat, send an email, customer service at selapub.com. Uh, and uh, Brenna said info at onelicense.net. Uh, the two of us, uh, between us, we'll try and work through questions that we get. We're happy to do that. And uh, I do thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, I thank you too. I'm, I'm really appreciative of this opportunity. Eileen and Elizabeth, thank you. I've been muting myself and typing furiously into the Q&A and I've gotten to a lot of questions. Um, typical millennial, we're multitasking at all times. Um, so if uh, I did not get to your question and I can confirm that I didn't because there were 500 of you on the call, uh, please email us, info at onelicense.net. We're happy to help. And I promise you, I said this to the panelists ahead of time, if we don't have the answer, we will tell you that we don't have the answer and we'll try to point you in the right direction. But you've been a wonderful audience. You've asked some fantastic questions and I really hope that you do continue to stay healthy and well. It is such a difficult season and if again no one has thanked you for the good work that you do for your ministries, let me be the one to thank you today. Uh, we really, really appreciate everything that you do to support our authors and composers and also everything that you do to support your congregation. So thank you. Thank you all. Everybody stay safe, stay well, and we will see you soon. Yes, right. stay healthy. Take care. Bye.